Well, hello, friends. It's great to be together again and continue our study of the book of Colossians. We're going to wind up Colossians today, and then the next time this class meets, we'll have kind of a, a galloping review of Philemon and Colossians, a big overview of the things we've covered in the last uh, 12, 13 weeks. Um, I'm not sure if that'll be uh, next weekend or, or two weeks from now because I'll be traveling this week. My schedule will be uncertain. At any rate, I thought it would be great for us to start today kind of back at the beginning of the book of Colossians and read the beautiful paragraph there. It begins in uh, chapter 1 and verse 18. Uh, some people think these are the words to an early hymn. Uh, other people uh, think it's it's just Paul getting on a really great riff about the nature of, of Jesus, or maybe it's a poem. Uh, we don't know, but let me just read it to you, and, and you can follow along. Uh, Colossians 1, uh, 18 through, uh, through 20. Excuse me, 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in Him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A lot of really deep theology there. And it, it contains a lot of essential concepts about the nature of Jesus Christ that Perhaps we as Christians uh, take for granted uh, things we've heard all along. He's the, the head of the body, the church. Uh, he is before all things. And then some really deep things like in him all things hold together. And the fact that he was uh, not only the firstborn over all creation, meaning he was the first thing that emerged from creation, but he, uh, in him all things were created. Uh, so it, it's not like God created him. It, it, it's like he was he was the part of God that that took uh, that did the creation or something. It's it's deep theology, and I'm not going to try to rehash that all right now. But I have a question for you, and that is this paragraph. Although it's beautiful language, what does it have to do with your everyday life, Monday through Saturday? How does this relate to the uh, to the thousand problems you have to solve tomorrow morning? You know, what, what does it have to do with with your Christian life, with the with the mechanics of uh, having a, a uh, relationship with other people in the in the faith family in the church congregation, of um, making things like worship services and and church ministries. Uh, come alive and, and happen. How, how does this all work? I'm sure if you were somewhat inventive, you could write an essay and, and try to connect all these things. And, and the fact that Jesus is the head over the body of the church and what that means in our everyday life and how his essential nature is reflected in our worship service. And, you know, there's some high thoughts. There's good thoughts uh, there. But, but what I'd like to point out is that, that Paul wrote these uh, things to the Colossians. And some people think that he wrote it in response to a specific false doctrine. We might call it a heresy that was uh, prevalent in that region at the time in, in Colossae. Uh, that, that tended to downgrade the importance of, of Jesus Christ in the Christian religion. And, and that may be. But, but here's the thing. We, we get some really deep and uh, detailed um, theology in chapter 1 and some more in chapter 2. And then we get into chapter 3 and there's some very practical instructions about Christian living, ending with a discussion of three important relationships that we talked about before. And then we get into the last part of chapter 4, and, and Paul is sending messages or 
giving messages from specific individuals. And for me, this is where that question that I raised earlier, the, the practical importance of this theology is, is answered. Because the, the majesty of, of Jesus being before all things, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, uh, in him the whole fullness of, of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. All those great truths are, are borne out in a very real way in chapter 4 because here's a collection of about 11 real flesh and blood people with their flaws and faults and imperfections, and they're trying to live the Christian life there in Colossae. They're trying to, to do church. And, you know, they have, some, they have some conflicts, they have some problems, they have some issues. Some people sing off key. I'm sorry. That's just, that's got to be. It just happens, you know. Some of us, which is not, we, you know, it, it's it's there, and and these are, uh, you know, your, but but despite their flaws and imperfections, Paul has such great things to say about so many of them. So so let's turn over there, uh, and and you know, kind of dive back in. Before we do that, though, I'd like to ask a review question, which I always do. And that is to look back at the beginning of chapter 4, specifically verses 5 and 6, and just list the uh, commands or advice that Paul gives regarding evangelism. Did, did you notice those? Uh, <clears throat> these are the verses where uh, Paul says, uh, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Well, a couple of things I'll point out that are obvious. First of all, if you're going to be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, you got to have a way to figure out who's an outsider and who's an insider. You know, who's, who's a, a disciple and, and who hasn't made that step to become a disciple yet. And I, I think the Bible is very clear that uh, for people to be disciples, they have to believe, repent, and, and be baptized. And, and people can come to that point of belief, repentance, and baptism from different points on the compass, different life experiences. Some may live a life that is, that is entirely reprobate, that's, that's completely pagan, that's uh, you know, just, just filled with, with sin and addiction and, and hor horrible things. And other people um, may be raised in a, uh, a very nurturing, strict Christian home, and, and they may come to the Lord uh, with with a very uh, pure conscience in, in a lot of ways. No one's perfect, but you know, and but still, this is this is the way the the Bible describes it. Who's an outsider and who's an insider? Insiders are people that have believed, repented, and, and been immersed. And uh, you know, you could you could slice that finer, and I'm I'm not not going to do that because I I don't have all the answers. Uh, you know, exactly uh, what about this person and and what about that person, but. You know, I think you can answer the question, what about you? Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, you need to be wise in the way you act. Why do you need to be wise in the way you act toward these people? Uh, I think the, the second, you know, first of all, figure out who's an insider and who's an outsider. And the second thing is you make an intentional effort. You, you're not going to be wise in the way you act toward outsiders if if you're not trying to. You know, you're, you're, you're going to have to want to uh, be salt and light and, and spread the gospel message and so you're going to be looking for those opportunities so you can make the most of, of all of them. Uh, and um, that's, that's going to be an, an important part of, of who you are. Not what you do, but who you are. Uh, so uh, this be wise in the way you act toward outsiders is, is echoed uh, by the words of Jesus when he sent his disciples out. He said, you know, you need to be as as wise, or in some translations it says, as cunning as snakes and as innocent as doves. It's quite easy for those of us who uh, are surrounded by fellow Christians, our, our families, our friends, and to quite, quite frankly be naive about what's going on in, in the world around us. And, and Jesus said, you don't need to be naive. You know, you, you can if if you uh, if if you if you're a friend of sinners, then you know a thing or two about sin. So he said, be wise in the way you act toward these outsiders, but don't be a crank. 
said, let your conversation always be full of grace. Now, you may not have noticed, but there's a, this is an election year in the United States of America. I, I'm just saying it's an election year. You may, maybe you hadn't heard. But, you know, is your conversation when you're talking about current events or maybe even politics, is it full of grace? Is it seasoned with salt? We talked about last week with them. See, you, people always want a little bit more of it, you know, when your conversation is full of grace and seasoned with salt. And uh, so uh, it's inspiring here. Uh, Paul, obviously, uh, evangelist par excellence, and he's got some... Uh, He's got some uh, advice for us. It's just before this, just four verses four and five, though. He says, I want you to pray for me. Even though he's chained there, Paul, Paul didn't take a day off from evangelism. He said, pray for me that I can make it clear, that I can proclaim this message. Oh, boy, what an inspiration he is. Well, anyway, th let's move on down into uh, uh, the section that we have remaining. And I believe we're ready for verse 11. So I'll just read a little bit here. Jesus, who is called justice, also sends greetings. Uh, they are, uh, these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Okay, these. Who are these? Well, he's already mentioned, uh, he's already mentioned uh, Aristarchus and Mark, and Jesus called justice. He's already mentioned Tychicus and Onesimus. I'm not sure if they're included in this statement about these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they proved a comfort to me. But here's the question. Remember chapter 3, verse 11? And Paul says, here there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, uh, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Uh, but, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute, Paul. You, you said there, there is no Jew or Greek. Uh, and, and here, you're mentioning these people are Jews. Is, is Paul being hypocritical? Uh, there is another place in the book of Romans. Uh, at the end, he has a section just like this. A lot of personal greetings. Chapter 16, verse 7. And he mentions uh, two people. He said, Andronicus and, and Junius are, are fellow Jews. Now, he, he wasn't very careful to tag, you know, every person. He's a Jew. That guy's not a Jew. He's a Jew. He's not a Jew. He didn't do that because earlier in, in chapter 16 of Romans, he mentions Aquila and Priscilla, and we know that from other places in the book of Acts, for example, we know that they're Jews, but he didn't tag them as Jews. He's just trying to say something positive about everybody. And I, I think the, the moral here is this, that, that there's no hierarchy in, in the kingdom of God. We don't have, like, Africans and then Americans and then Asians. Uh, we, don't, we don't have uh, black people, brown people, white people. Uh, the, the, somebody said the ground at the foot of the cross is level. We don't have men, women, children. You know, it, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Now, we may have different roles to play, and it doesn't mean that we have to deny our culture, that we all have to speak uh, the same, or speak Koine Greek like the New Testament's written in. It's fine for you to speak your mother tongue. And if you enjoy your national holiday, if, if you're Chinese, for example, and you enjoy the Lunar New Year and eating dumplings and, you know, getting together and watching a TV special or having friends to, you know, play the games and, and sing the songs and do the things that Chinese people like to do for Chinese New Year, that's great. And, and if, if I'm an American and I'm living in China and I want to get together with some other Americans and, and have Thanksgiving or the Fourth of July, that's not sinful. It's not sinful until we begin to draw lines in our fellowship and to have, uh, have a hierarchy. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to verse 12. Uh, Epaphras, or some people might say Epaphras. I don't know. Uh, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. This guy, Epaphras, has, Paul can't say enough good things about him, and, and evidently he really is a good guy. Uh, what, what do we know about him? And, and this is, a, I encourage you if you use a computer Bible to, to do word searches on people like 
uh, Epaphras, or if, if you're not into using computer Bible, there are plenty of nice Bible dictionaries out there, other reference works, and you can look up. And, and he's mentioned several other times, uh, for example, in Philemon 23, and we study Philemon, uh, Epaphras is described as a fellow prisoner. Most importantly, with regard to Colossians, and you may not remember this, but chapter 1, verse 7, uh, Paul's talking about the gospel message, and he said, you learned it from Epaphras. The idea here is he was a missionary who started the church in Colossae. Remember, this is a place that Paul's never been. And so Epaphras started the church in Colossae, and now he's in prison with Paul, wherever that happens to be, and we've mentioned uh, three or four possibilities, Caesarea, Ephesus, probably Rome. And, and he, so he and Paul are, are sharing their uh, confinement close enough where Paul hears him wrestling in prayer. Maybe they were prayer partners or they prayed together. And uh, Epaphras not only mentioned the church, he says wrestling in prayer. Uh, you know, I would, I would really like to hear that, uh, that kind of prayer. Here's some words that Paul uses to describe Epaphras. Fellow servant, faithful minister, servant of Christ Jesus. Doesn't get much better than that as far as I'm concerned. And certainly in, in, in the mind of Paul, I don't think it gets much better than that. Then we come to one of the neatest people in the whole New Testament, in, in my humble opinion, and uh, that is Luke. Our dear friend Luke the doctor, and Demas in greetings. Our dear friend Luke the doctor. Uh, Luke, we think, is Luke the evangelist who wrote the Gospel of Luke and volume two of that book, which is Acts. Now, this is Bible trivia, but what is the longest book in the New Testament? It is Luke, and Acts is a respectable second. And if you put those two books together, based upon the word count in the original, the, the Greek language, uh, you get about 27% of the uh, length of the New Testament. So this guy, Luke, wrote more of the New Testament than Paul, even though Paul wrote 13 out of 27 books. A lot of them are real short. And uh, more than, you know, any other author, and to me anyway, it's, it's pretty clear that when you read Luke and Acts, that the same, you're, you're listening to the vocabulary, the thought pattern, the sentence structure, it's the same person writing it. So we, we think this is the same Luke. This is the only place where he's identified as a doctor, and he's not included among the, uh, the, the Jews that Paul said have been a great comfort to me. Uh, so we think he's a Gentile doctor. The thing that I think is so wonderful about Luke, besides the fact that I personally find his writing very compelling, is that he always keeps himself in the background. He doesn't appear anywhere in the Gospel of Luke, and some people think maybe he became a Christian after Jesus died, or became a disciple of Jesus after Jesus died. Uh, he, he just shows up, and you have to really read the book of Acts closely, because he'll go from saying, and, and we went here, and we did that, to Paul went there, and they went there, and they did that. I think there are three we sections in Paul. So Paul will drop him off for a while and come back around and pick him up again. First time we see him, I think, is about uh, Acts chapter, what would that be, uh, 16, 15, 16, in, in a Troas. And then, then Paul drops him off in, in Philippi, and then picks him up again. But he, he's very much in the background. He doesn't uh, he doesn't make a very big role for himself. Uh, you wouldn't, unless you read carefully, you won't know whether Luke is there or not. You know, I've, I've often thought if um, if I wrote the book of Acts instead of saying, uh, you know, uh, in my former treatise, a most excellent Theophilus, that's the way he starts off, referring back to the book of Luke, I would say, uh, the name of this book is 30 Years a Christian Doctor. <laughs> I would be, the, but not Luke. He's not the main main character, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, another, just another thing about Luke. One one thing that I really like about him, he emphasizes discipleship, and and the second thing is that he he writes, and he makes it clear that he's writing history. He doesn't start off once upon a time. He gives lots of historical detail, and by and large, his historical detail. His description of geography, his description, uh, his, his specification of uh, government structures, of society, uh, of customs, uh, it's, it's, it's all authentic. There, there are only a few problems with, with Luke's account from a historian's uh, viewpoint. So I think this is very valuable, 
we, we read about these miracles and these supernatural things happening, and we think, could that really happen? And, and Luke's saying, well, I was, I checked on these things pretty closely, or I was there, you know, I, I, this, these are the facts, just the facts, ma'am. That's, that's, uh, that's the way Luke writes. Next person, not much is said here. It says, and Demas, send greetings, and Demas. Nothing good about Demas. In fact, we run into Demas uh, again in uh, 2 Timothy. <clears throat> and Paul says, 2 Timothy 4.10, and it's on your handout sheet if you choose to print out your handout sheet. 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, Demas, in love with this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And, you know, you got got to wonder, what's wrong with loving the world? I mean, here I sit behind my house on a little deck that I built, surrounded by these beautiful trees, breathing this cool air, uh, drinking a cup of coffee, enjoying you, my friends, being with me, studying this beautiful text. What's, so, what's wrong with, with enjoying life, with, with loving the world? In fact, John 3.16 says what? It says, for God so loved the world. And Paul is slamming Demas here. He says he's in love with this world. And then, to top it all off, you, you get into uh, 1 John 2.15, and maybe you remember this verse. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Just like First John, you know, everything's black and white, a very absolutist text. So uh, what do we make of all this? <clears throat> and I think, again, we have to realize that the language of love and hate in the Bible is intended to act like a screen or a filter or a sieve. And it's intended to say, well, if, if you don't, if you don't hate your life relative to the love that you have for God and his kingdom and his church, if, if you even loved your family, your loved ones, on par with your feelings towards God, if you don't love him so much that it's, it's almost hate by comparison for your, your family, your life, your profession, your job, the beautiful trees around you, then you're not going to make it. You're not getting it. You're, the love of the Father is not in you. And, and Demas evidently, you know, we got this old song, girls just want to have fun, and he just wanted to have fun evidently. Or he just wanted to make money, or he just, just, he just wanted to see Thessalonica again. You know, he just, and, and so he deserted Paul. Uh and so his name uh, lives on in uh, in infamy uh, because of this because of this reference. <clears throat> Next, a little more positive note here. It says that uh, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea. And I, I think we've mentioned a couple of times uh, the fact that uh, Laodicea and Colossae are, are pretty pretty close to each other, and there's probably some interaction between the two. Some people think even you know, maybe Philemon and Onesimus live down at uh, at Laodicea. I'm not so sure about that, uh, but there's a lot of uh, interaction between the two. He mentioned that uh, Epaphras is working hard for you there at Colossae and for the church at Laodicea and Heropolis. Maybe he had started all three of these churches, and now they were supporting him uh, like a missionary, and he was traveling and been in prison there with Paul, and they'd sent him some financial support, so he's working for them. I, I, I don't know, but at any rate, the point is close relationship between Colossae and Laodicea, and, and Paul says, tell those people hello for me, and to Nympha and the church in her house. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, we got this beautiful theology up front and these real people in the back. Nympha, kind of a pretty name, uh, a woman, a female name, and the church in her house, and maybe her house church is down there at Laodicea. House churches are mentioned uh, a few times in the New Testament. Uh, 
they are mentioned uh, in connection with Aquila and Priscilla and uh, in first Corinthians and also in Romans uh, the references are on your sheet here uh, Lydia church met at her house at least once or twice maybe on a regular basis in in Philippi and there was a, a church that met at Philemon's house in the opening verse uh, second verse of Philemon it says um, and the church that meets at your house you know this is this letter goes to uh, Philemon and Apthia, which is probably his wife, and Archippus, which is probably his son, and the church that meets at your house. So uh, the, the concept of house churches, although it's not ubiquitous in the New Testament, it's there. Now, what's not in the New Testament, not, 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 is church buildings. I don't think it's unscriptural to have church buildings. I think the church commands and teaches that Christians need to assemble. In fact, we probably need to assemble a whole lot more often than we do the the church in Jerusalem, according to the book of Acts, met daily. But we need places to, to do stuff. And, uh, you know, we can rent a place or, or we can have a building. And it's, it's probably better for us to, to have a building. But th there is something about the, the house church that captures so many wonderful things that are typical of the, of the first century. And that's one thing we try to do with our FaceTime groups in the Oxford Church of Christ. Uh, house churches are more a reality, I think, in, in many parts of the world, like, like China, where a public assembly is a challenge, um, and a very important part of, of the Lord's work there. Uh, there is kind of a house church movement uh, throughout the United States and, and the Western world, where some people are saying this is the best way to do it, or maybe they're saying this is the only way to do it. Uh, but I want you just to think a minute about Nympha. Let's get back to Nympha, get back to the text here. And what do you think was involved in, in having the church assemble at her house? Uh, and some of you have been hosts for FaceTime groups. Maybe it's a one-off. You do it once a semester or twice a semester, or you do it every Sunday or every other Sunday. I think our, our FaceTime groups tend to meet every other Sunday. I know that, uh, you know, Les Ferguson had uh, our group meet at his house uh, several times, Les and Becky. And so, you know, you've got to you got to clean up a little bit. You got to move things out of the way. You got to get some, you know, table chairs out. Maybe uh, you may have to plan a a, a meal or coordinate uh, some some refreshments. Uh, you got to put the dog up if if the dog is like our dogs. Um, you you got to you got to move out of the way a little bit. And probably this is just my opinion. We do way too much cleaning up and, and, and putting away, and, and we, we ought to just let people come in and, and be with us uh, like, like family so we don't get quite so, uh, you know, uptight and, and busy uh, about it. I don't mean not do anything, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking sometimes we get a, a little, we, we overemphasize our, our preparations a little too much when we have people in. Uh, but the real-world logistics of figuring out who's going to prepare the communion and who's going to lead the prayer and and uh you know what time are we going to start and, and and how about the children how can we keep the children occupied or what sort of teaching do we need for the children uh what about the singing you know so and so likes this song and i don't like that song and we don't like the way they sing or we don't like the instrument you know it's it's uh they have to put it all together they have to put it all together and and so the the messiness of of everyday Christian life, of uh, some people being incapacitated, some people being isolated, whether it's by disease or imprisonment, some people in love with this present world, like like Demas, it, it's it's all here, and so the the beautiful theology really does apply to people in their real world occupation for the Lord, which brings us to possibly my favorite verse in the whole book and that is verse 17 tell Archippus see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord what was Archippus ministry and why was Paul so worried that he finished it you know Paul's a long way away it's probably been a long time since he's seen Archippus He's really close to, to Archippus and, and his family Philemon. And this is one reason why people think, well, maybe Philemon is in Laodicea because Paul doesn't know the church in Colossae. How could he know Philemon and his family? So those Philemon will never say, 
fix up your guest room. I'm going to come stay with you. That's what he says in Philemon. Remember that? But uh, evidently, there is a connection between uh, Philemon and Archippus and, and the church and Colossae. But why didn't he put that personal note to Archippus back in the Philemon personal letter? It does say, in the church that meets at your house, but it's to obviously a smaller group of people than this, than this letter to Colossae. In fact, he gets to the end here. He says, now, when you get through with this letter, you exchange it with, with the folks in Laodicea. And, and make sure they read this, and, and you read the letter from Laodicea. And, and so Archippus kind of gets it's right up front, and it's it's kind of like you know the teacher calls you out of the uh, you're in the back of the room, and they'll say, they'll say and and you back there, you you know Doug Shields, you need to pay attention to this. Kind of calls him out. What's the thing here? I'd like to suggest that that he is exercising a certain level of community accountability with Archippus. That he has, um, he's taken responsibility for something. And it involves the church. When somebody takes responsibility for a ministry, that involves the church. And he says, see that you finish. It's so much easier to start a ministry than it is to finish it. You ever notice that? There's always a lot of enthusiasm and idealism. And, and then when it gets to the day-to-day -day of, of making it work and making it happen and, and, and continuing on through discouragement and it, it gets not fun anymore and it's, it's just a job, it's just work, you know, it, it's, it begins to be washing feet. There's not a lot of recognition, not a lot of glory involved. People are not responding the way we'd like for them to respond. And so Paul says, finish the job. Oh, I think that's so important for every one of us that engage in any sort of ministry. And if you're a Christian, I hope you have some sort of ministry. You may have heard me say before that you need, uh, you need a relationship with the Lord. You need a friend or a relationship with somebody in the body. And you need some form of ministry if you're going to survive spiritually. So if you get a ministry, uh, remember Paul's instruction here. See that you complete the ministry that you've received in the Lord. Then Paul says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. Uh, most of Paul's letters, he used a stenographer that we would call an amanuensis, somebody that wrote for him, but at the end, he would pick up the pen and write himself. And many people think this is a safeguard against forgery. So he dictated much of his, his letters, but then at the end, he would, he would write, he would signature, he would give the original signature with his own hand. His last request uh, for the church in Colossae is remember my chains. Remember my chains. And so from the chained hand of Paul in the first century to you and me here in the 21st century, that is uh, Paul's great letter to the Colossians. I, I hope you will pray for me this week as I pray for you. I hope this has been a blessing and a benefit to you in your Christian walk uh, this week. God bless you.